You are listening to the Indie Drills Podcast. I am Chad Wilson. We are here to talk defensive back talk coverage, playing defense. That's what we do on the Indie Drills Podcast, and I'm happy to be here with you. Of course, sponsored by the book that I always keep with me. I keep a 101 DB Tips copy on me at all times because you never know when you might have to break out and cover someone. If you're a DB, you're a DB coach, you are a trainer of defensive backs, this is the book for you. Over 100 of the best tips you will ever get on playing defensive back. Everything from playing nickel to safety to corner, how to cover man, how to play zone, how to watch film, train in the offseason. It's all right here in this book, 101 DB Tips. Get yourself your copy. Check the link down in the description below, or if you're listening to the podcast, I will also have it linked there as well. Or you can go to 101dbtips.com for more information and to pick up your copy. A couple of things to get to on the show today. There was a Monday night football game. Some very interesting things that happened there from a DB perspective. We'll talk about that. Uh, talk a little bit about what's going on with the Miami Dolphins offense. You know, look, the Tua injury aside, what's going on there? We'll talk about that some. We'll also talk about a very interesting coverage that I am seeing pop up in the National Football League. It's very familiar to me, and I will explain why on that. From our mailbag, a question about press man coverage that I'm eager to answer because I know it affects quite a few guys out there, and so maybe be able to give you some help on that. And then finally, we'll talk about an under-trained skill that defensive backs really need to start getting on if they want to survive and thrive at the defensive back position. So all that coming up on the this episode and edition of the Indy Drills podcast. All right, so let's talk about the Monday night football game. You know, you thought Eagles, Falcons, it's not the most glamorous matchup, not the worst matchup either, but we were treated to a very nice football game, one with all of the drama that you can want that came down to the final moments. I'm sure the networks, ABC, was that ABC? I don't even know who televises the games anymore. ESPN, ABC, um, as well as just fans of football could love because it came down to the final moments of the game. And, you know, one of these Kirk Cousins specials, um, if you follow the channel on YouTube, Emil and I talked a little bit about this game. We give predict uh, predictions every week on both college and NFL football. So we did have a little bit of a discussion on this, and this thing kind of unfolded the way that we would. Now, we didn't predict a Falcons win, but um, thought it would be close and that things would kind of hash out the way that they did. So um, a pat on the back for us. But from a defensive back perspective, a couple of things there. I was totally puzzled um, by the way the Eagles went about handling that final drive on defense. As you know, in the offseason, they picked up Vic Fangio, uh, perhaps one of the, the if, one of, if not the most notable defensive coordinators in the NFL right now, there are a lot of guys coaching off of the Vic Fangio tree. There are a lot of teams out there running um, a lot of the things that Vic Fangio either, you know, introduced to the league or made rather famous through his, uh, re, uh, you know, various stops in the NFL. So um, obviously a very accomplished and experienced guy. And Vic Fangio knows a lot more about this game than I ever will, if I can say that. But I will say I totally disagree with, the mode that they went into at the end of the game, which was just to play soft coverage, keep everything in front of you, and just have the Falcons go down the field in record time. Even with the drop by Saquon Barkley um, that kind of you know screwed things up for the Eagles, the third down play in which they chose not to run the ball and run some more time off the clock and instead came up with a pass play, that went to Saquon Barkley, who, by the way, was wide open in the flat. If he catches that ball and turns it up, you know, he potentially scores, at the very least gets the first down, and they can run that clock up as far down as they wanted to. But even without that happening, there wasn't much time on that clock, far under two minutes. Um, I want to say it was under a minute, if memory serves correctly, for the Falcons to head the length of the field. I mean, they were deep in their own territory, you would think this is the Eagles, this is the Eagles defense. This is a team that was in the Super Bowl not too long ago, two, three years ago. It's in the Super Bowl, and, you know, they've got some players over there. They've got guys in the secondary, nice uh, rookie corner in Quinion Mitchell, a, a 
savvy veteran in Darius Slay. They got Chauncey Gardner Johnson back. Um, and they've got dudes. They've drafted well on that side. Yes, they had their defensive problems last year. Everyone knows about it. But you've got Vic Fangio now. And now we should be able to make good use of these names that we have on that side of the ball. And to just lay back and let the Falcons just run down the field uninterrupted and just sit in zones and pockets and let Kirk Cousins <laughs> essentially look like a $100 million quarterback. Now, all of us out there, most of us out there, let's just be real and honest, did not think that he was worthy of that contract, especially off of, you know, an Achilles injury. And in week one, we were all proven right. Now, granted, that was against the Pittsburgh Steelers defense that now looks like it's, you know, two weeks in, looks like it's going to be a pretty good defense. So, not the best team to start off against if you're trying to show your wares as a newly minted $100 million quarterback. But nevertheless, Philadelphia Eagles, Vic Fangio, if you're just going to sit back there and lay back, there are a lot of quarterbacks in this league, and they don't have to be in the top two tiers of quarterbacks that can make something happen. And boy, Kirk Cousins did. There's one thing Cousins can do is drop back, sit in the pocket, go through his progressions, and hit players in windows. And that's exactly what the Eagles set up for them. They had trouble getting a pass rush all night. You could say you could credit the uh, Falcons offensive line, or you could just say that's a poor effort by the Eagles. But with that being the case for the majority of the game, this was the time to pressure Kirk Cousins. Once again, this is an aging veteran quarterback that is off an Achilles injury and was not a mobile guy to begin with. You've got to play to that weakness. You've got to send guys after him. And once again, at the corner spots, you've got a great young corner in Quinion Mitchell and Darius Slay. You've got to ask those guys to hold it down and play some man coverage. I'm not sure about what matchup that, you know, you would have had a problem with. You take your chances with that and you force a guy like Kirk Cousins to make pinpoint throws under pressure moving off of his feet. You can't just let him sit back there in the pocket with time and run through progressions and hit windows. He can do that. All right. There's a lot of things Kirk Cousins can't do in this league, and they've been pointed out ad nauseum by a lot of people. But drop back like it's seven on seven and hit the windows. He definitely can do that, which he did. Got all the way down to the end. And then, unfortunately, I don't know what was happening with Darius Slay on that last play, but it just goes to show that even a savvy veteran who's been an all-pro and a multi-time pro bowler in this league can have those moments. And uh, unfortunately, Slay got caught with his eyes in the backfield. It almost seemed like he was expecting a different route or something different to happen. He just froze up for whatever reason, eyes in the backfield, and gives up you know, a quick out right inside the pylon. And I could see the disappointment in his face. Now, fans were on his case afterwards because there's video of him going up to Drake London and telling him nice route and, you know, um, a bit of a laugh about it. I know that's a bad look for fans, but if you know Darius Slade, that's just kind of his personality. Just know that inside he's not feeling good about it and that, you know, he's going to go to work about it. But that's just outwardly that's um, what he brings. But I know what it is for fans. You live and die with every game for your team and for you know, those that were in attendance, it costs an awful lot to go to those games. I get it, you know, between the parking, the eating and, uh, you know, Uber ride or park, you know, all that good stuff costs a lot of money and you're, you, and you're bumped when the game's over. So you don't really want to see your star corner um, hemming it up with the opposing player and team afterwards. But that's just a matter of Slay's personality. If he's not operating that way, then, you know, something's wrong and it would be time to worry about it. But it just goes to show for um, even you young corners out there that, um, yeah, you want to be consistent. You want to do things the right way. But even at the top of this game, you can experience um, a brain fart, for lack of a better word. And I think that's probably how Darius Slay would, um, you know, describe that. So that was that on the Monday night game, a thrilling game, um, unfortunately. It play did not the game did not end on a defensive play as we would like to see happen here on the Indie Drills podcast. It ended up on an offensive play, a touchdown, and it was uh, on a defensive back. So 
um, unfortunately there, but there's some things to learn from uh, what happened there, both, you know, with the, the way the defense was run for all you coaches out there, analyze that. Listen, when you've got a wounded quarterback, basically, and I'm by wounded, I don't mean he's hurt, but just a guy that can't move in the pocket. Last thing you want to do is just let him sit up in there and go through his progressions. At the very least, a coverage like two man is great against a guy like that. You know, you get your 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 defensive backs in there inside and underneath and take away the easy underneath throws, which are what is needed in, you know, a two minute situation. Plus, you have the protection of two safeties deep as you try and work some kind of pass rush. It's not like Kirk Cousins can pull the ball down and gut you for 20 or 30 yards. That's just really not what could happen. And if you are worried about that, you rush three, you hold one of your rushers back to spy him and make it difficult for him. But I've seen teams run two man on Kirk Cousins with great uh, success. And I think you should have at least had a couple of those pop in uh, to that situation. Didn't see any of that. We They played a lot of quarters and, um, didn't work out in the end. Well, I'd love to see what the adjustments are going to be coming up. Real quick, the Miami Dolphins uh, offense. Listen, prior to the injury for Tua, and, and pr- this probably led to what happened there with Tua, but through two weeks, now the Jaguars played pretty good defense. That's what the Dolphins played in week one. Um, and then the Bills can, you know, they're up and down defensively. They can play good defense as well. But we're talking about the National Football League. And this Miami Dolphins offense was extremely explosive. I mean, they put 70 points up on an NFL team last year. But what I've seen through the first two games is it looks like teams have figured things out, especially with Tua. The kind of offense that's being run by Mike McDaniels, which is, you know, extremely similar to what's being run in San Francisco by Kyle Shanahan, is uh, an offense that really tries to take advantage of the middle of the field. A lot of the throws are in the middle of the field, and even more so in the Miami Dolphins system, where you don't have a strong arm quarterback like, um, you don't have a strong arm quarterback in Tua. There are very few throws that are designed to go outside of the numbers. Now, they may end up there. There may be throws that are made outside of the numbers, but certainly not a ton of them that are designed that way and I think teams now are getting a little bit hip to that and they're packing the middle of the field and if you're not really getting off with the run they don't overly respect those RPOs so the RPOs that end up with the little slants um, or the bang eights they're taking those away and it's going to be a very interesting to see how the Dolphins adjust to this and then what the offense looks like now that Skylar Thompson is going to be running this and potentially newly signed Tyler Huntley, see how things change there. Do they spread things out a little more? And by spread things out, yes, the Dolphins will spread you out formation-wise, but they don't spread you out with the actual throws that are being made. And I think through a couple of years of Mike McDaniel in Miami, I think teams are starting to figure out, yeah, we don't really have to cover out there too much. And let's just force those throws that they don't really want to make. Go ahead. You want to throw the ball outside of the numbers? Go do that. And that's the essence of playing defense. It really is finding what is the offense's strength, defending that, take that away from them, and essentially make uh, make the offense play left-handed. You know, if you're guarding a guy in basketball, he's a right-handed guy, you want to sit on that right hand and force the guy to go left and see if he can be as dynamic going left as he is going right. And that's what you do defensively. Um, when you're going against an offense, let's take away those things that make them comfortable, that get them in a groove, that they are good at. Let's force them to um, make the throws they don't want to make, run the plays that they don't really feel all that confident in. And I think the league has really caught up to that. At least defensive coordinators have done that. Uh, a lot of what you see happening in the league is when an offense takes off and explodes and has a good amount of success, success the following offseason um, – Teams and defensive coordinators really get to studying that and break things down and they'll find your weaknesses and they'll find the things that you don't do and they'll come up with adjustments. And now it's on that offense to counter that. And another thing that I want to see before I check off on this particular topic is that we are seeing a lot more running of the football, at least through these first couple of weeks in the NFL. We're seeing teams a little more committed to the run. 
We're seeing fullbacks come into the game again. Fullbacks are now being reintroduced. We're seeing a lot more multiple tight end sets. And this is simply just a function of uh, defenses getting lighter to handle all of the spread out pass happy offenses that we've been seeing over the last few years. Um, there are smaller bodies out there, the more hybrid linebackers. Their teams are playing with nickel to start off a game. That is their base defense, five defensive backs. And now we get the inevitable adjustment where now if the defense is going to have smaller guys out there, we're going to get bigger offensively. And this is something that's just happened over time in the game of football. Offenses expand, get smaller, try to take advantage of space as the defense gets smaller to handle um, and move around in that space and cover guys in that space. The offenses will now compact and get back down inside and have bigger guys out there, get more tight ends, get fullbacks, get more physical, start running the football. So I think we probably need to just prepare ourselves for that this season in the NFL and perhaps for the next few years as the defenses now start trying to catch back up. And we're going to start seeing um, bigger linebackers now to handle all of the stuff that goes on in the run games, the counters, the pulling linemen, the getting to the second levels. And maybe now we stop having base nickel defenses and we start going back to four DBs out in the field. And all this stuff trickles down into college, high school, and, you know, what guys decide to play, what positions guys decide that they want to play as they come up. Um, it's it's funny when, you know, you make those decisions going into high school or in youth football about what you want to play down the road because of where you see the game going. And then, you know, you get close to that point and now the game has changed, right? There was a time where everyone wanted six foot two, six foot three cornerbacks. And now we're back to the 5'11", six-foot corners. I mean, yeah, you know, teams still do love tall, long corners, but it's where every team had to have them, and teams, even some teams wanted to have a pair of those guys. Now we're seeing 5'11 corners, 5'10 corners coming back into the game because, you know, the game is changing a little bit. So always interesting, you know, to see that kind of stuff happen. Also interesting for me is to see the introduction of – this particular coverage coming into the league. And I'm going to tell you why it's especially interesting to me. The coverage I'm talking about is what I call trio coverage, but to explain it to you, yes, some of you may be watching this on YouTube and it'd be nice for me to break out some video for you, but I'm not going to do that to my podcast audience that might be streaming this on Apple or Spotify or Anchor or you know something of that nature. I'm going to keep it all words. You guys are just going to have an imagination. I am going to be breaking this down further in the All Eyes DB Camp members area. By the way, I have a really big announcement coming up on uh, and about the All Eyes DB Camp members area. So you guys stay tuned here on YouTube, Instagram, um, and on the AllEyesDBCamp.com. Really great, um, exciting, big announcement coming up about the All Eyes DB Camp members area. But I will be breaking this down further just to give you guys a visual and go a little bit more into detail. But trail uh, coverage is an alignment for me. So just trio is not necessarily a coverage. Trio is actually an alignment, and I'm starting to see this filter into the league, and I'm excited about it. And again, I'll tell you why. But what it involves is a look of three safeties over the top. So, you know, whereas you would normally see um, too high coverage where you've got a safety on one hash or near the hash and another safety on or near the other hash, now teams are occasionally running a defense, and the team that I've seen doing it the most are the Arizona Cardinals, where they have a three-safety look. So a safety right outside one hash, a safety right outside another hash, and then a safety right there in the middle of the field. And they're running multiple different movements off of that. It does give you the ability to hide disguise coverage and now move guys and rotate guys a little bit more when you do that. Now, of course, it kind of makes you soft against the run because you've lightened the box a little bit. So you've got to be, um, you've got to be very strategic in how you use this. But I started seeing this last year. I'm seeing more teams than just the Cardinals do this. And there's a lot of great things that you can do out of it. The reason that I'm excited about this is this is something I started running way back in 2010. It started when I was a youth football coach. And we had, you know, it's not normal for you to see, or at least back then, for you to see prolific passing attacks at the younger ages in youth football. I'm talking about, you know, ages 9 and 10 years old and 
this was the level at which I was coaching at that time, the defensive coordinator in charge of getting these kids ready each and every week. And we were facing a prolific passing attack and a very good quarterback, very nice route concepts. I was extremely impressed, to be honest. I think I'd been coaching youth football for like three or four years at this point. And the majority of the teams that you go up against have outstanding running backs and great ground games because that's an easy thing to do. Take a snap, hand the ball to, you know, a, a super advanced young athlete who can't get tackled. And that's just kind of the way things ran back then. But this particular team in the Boca Jets, all right, down here in South Florida, let me just give them some credit, came out with this high-flying passing attack. But what I did notice is they did not have a dynamic running back, and it really was all about the pass and rolling up the pass stats. So I unleashed this defense. You know, I was a guy that would sit there and draw up stuff all over sheets of paper. Me and Macaroni Grill, if you guys have ever been to that restaurant and they have that paper um, you know, cloth that they would put over the table and give crayons. The crayons are supposed to be for the kids. No, no, those crayons were for me. And I would draw up stuff all the time, all the time, all the time. So in all my drawing as I prepared for this passing attack, because quite frankly, you don't build your defenses in youth football to be handling high-flying passing attacks. It's all about stopping the run. So I had a little bit of a challenge on my hand. So I came up with this idea of having three safeties back there. When that quarterback comes and he gets on the center or he stands there in a shotgun and he's surveying the field, he's seeing three guys deep. And first of all, that's going to play some tricks with his, with his mind. Do I have those deep throws? Because, you know, look, I don't care what passing attack it is. You do want to have those deep throws. So those are taken away um, right away. You also have two corners that can now sit in the flat if you want them to. They don't have to retreat. So you don't have easy throws out into the flat. Now, you might have some windows on the inside, but you can do some things to play around with that and take those throws away. There's really a lot you can do when you line up in this trio three safety look. And lo and behold, we absolutely smothered that passing attack by that youth football team. Held them to less yards than anyone had that year. Um, I think we had three interceptions in the game, ended the game on an interception. So we thoroughly harassed this high-flying Little League passing attack and I put that one in the books and kept it with me, took it all the way to uh, when I started coaching high school football and ran it with great success. There were times where I ran that for an entire game against teams. Outside of that, though, I used it strategically, certain pass situations uh, against certain formation, things like that. I had a tremendous amount of success with it way back in 2010. So for it to be now 2024 and see these defenses using this now, that warms my heart. That just shows me that, look, came up with a great concept there. I'm not saying these teams copied me, but who knows? You never know. There's film of it out there. You know, all it takes is some defensive coordinator to be going around on YouTube or the Internet and see something and say, hey, what if we do that at this level? So if in any way, shape or form, I help put that idea out there and I'm seeing it now at the highest levels, well, you know, that warms my heart. But just for the rest of you guys out there, start paying attention to it. I know if you're watching a TV copy of a game, it might be uh, hard for you to see that. It might be difficult for you to see those three safeties back there unless, you know, there's a play made and then they run a replay and it shows you a big wider copy. But if you do have access or you do see it on Twitter, you see like some coaches copy where it's the all 22. And for you guys that are new to football and coaching out there, the all 22 is um, a a high copy from above in the stadium where you see all 22 players on the field, start taking note of that and seeing how some teams are incorporating this three safety look at certain situations in a game, typically third and long. But I'm here to tell you there are so, as someone who is a veteran of running this defense, and to be quite honest, call myself one of the forefathers of this. I'd never seen anyone doing it before I started doing it, so that's why I would say that. There are so many things. I developed a whole defense out of that. And in fact, I am uh, right now putting together a playbook of um, all the things you could do in that three safety look. You guys could comment here in the comment section. Let me know if I should put something like that out. If you'd like to have something like that, go ahead and let me know in the comment section. And I will, uh, dub I will double down on it and get that thing out to you sooner. But you guys let me know down in the comments section because there's just so much you could do out of it. And if you guys have smoking hot 
passing offenses that are a problem in your league, this is definitely something that could throw some cold water on that. All right. So look forward to hearing um, from you guys on that. But otherwise, though, just start paying attention to that. And like I said, the Arizona Cardinals are one of the teams that I see using it the most, but I've seen it pop up some other places. Wouldn't be surprised to see someone like Brian Flores using it. These are guys are kind of off the beat. They don't just run what everyone else is running. The Flores is more apt to be creative in terms of blitzes and less so with what he does in the back end. But he is a creative guy, so you never know what he's going to come up with. He doesn't just coach out of the box. He coaches. He, he jumps outside of that box and comes up with stuff. So something for you to look at there. Time now for us to hit the mailbox. And I've got this good. I like this question right here because this is a common problem. And kudos to this guy for asking about it and trying to get help with it instead of trying to tackle it himself. Francis from Philadelphia, PA says, our team has been playing a lot of press man and I've been struggling. I keep missing the jam and ending up in trail position. Then he hits me with uh, one of my taglines. What am I doing wrong? Well, Francis has asked me this question without the benefit of film. So we are going to have to do some diagnostics and propose several um, remedies for this. And you're just going to have to apply it to whatever possibly could be happening to you here. There are a number of reasons why guys will miss a jam at the line of scrimmage. The first thing I'm going to address is your eyes because it's the most important and it's also the hardest for you to correct because you can't see your eyes. You really are going to kind of need the help of someone else or you're just going to have to be really intuitive and in tune with what's happening and know that that is the problem. What happens for a lot of guys in press man is they will start off, they will get in their stance, they will have their eyes where they need to be and oh, by the way, I'm a proponent of looking at the hip at the waist. This is a question that I get asked. For me, I felt like this was, you know, this was a no-brainer. This is what everyone does. But over time, I found out there have been coaches who have coached different things in terms of where they look. The V of the neck, look at the feet. Um, I've even heard some say the shoulders, which is crazy to me. That's the last place I think you'd want to look. But I'm a proponent of looking at the waist. That's going to move slower than anything else on the body. All right. So their eyes will be there on the hips. And then the moment the ball is snapped, the eyes fly up. This is a common problem, not just for youth guys. It's a common problem um, I see with guys that I train that are in the NFL. It's a common problem. And there's some remedies for it. But. That's a problem number one. So you're going to probably need someone else to stand in front of you on the opposite side when you're taking some press man reps. And they're going to have to give you some feedback as to whether or not your eyes are staying down once the ball is snapped, once the wide receiver moves. That's the most common issue that happens. Your eyes fly up. You're looking at the receiver's shoulders. They're moving very fast. You're throwing a hand out and you're getting fooled because the shoulders are moving rather quickly and you have to react so fast. You help yourself when you keep your eyes down low, you look at the slower moving waist and you shoot your hands above your eyes. I have a very good video on this using a sled on my YouTube channel. I'm just gonna have to go through the videos there and find it, but I go a little bit more in depth in that. And of course, I, I talk about this quite a bit in the All Eyes DB Camp members area with drills and everything else. Um, to help you with that. But just from a basic standpoint, your eyes, you're going to need to keep those down on the hips even after the wide receiver moves so that you can not get fooled by the movement of the wide receiver. Their thing is to be explosive and shake with their shoulders and get you out of whack early, and that's what gets you to miss. Excuse me. But that's number one. So you're going to need to control your eyes. You might need the help of a friend to guard you on that. If you're having a problem keeping your eyes on the waist, even after you've been told about it and you've tried to give it, you know, your best try, something I've had success with in training guys is starting with the eyes down on the feet. And for whatever reason, you have a natural reaction to raise your eyes upon the move and you're not able to correct it. Starting with your eyes down on the feet, the moment the guys move, your eyes will go up that will be to the hips, and now they are in the right spot. The eyes go from the feet up to the hips, and you keep them on the hips. 
you'll be okay. Just remember to shoot your hands above your eyes, all right? And don't you don't have to look at the shoulders to hit the shoulders because once your eyes goes on the shoulders, you're going to get fooled. The next thing is this. Another common problem, especially with the younger guys, is your depth. And by that, how far off of the wide receiver are you aligned? A lot of guys get way too close to that wide receiver. And at the youth level, I mean, and the, if the, at the youth level and high school level, you might be able to get away with it because you're going to line up in some wide receivers that are inexperienced and unaware, and they're going to allow you to align that close. If you have the ability to do that, if you align close enough to where you can touch that receiver, then you touch him the moment that ball is snapped. The moment that ball is snapped, you've got to shoot your hands right now. There's no waiting. He's already close to you. If you don't shoot your hands right now, his first step vertical is going to put him even with you, and he's going to be facing up the field, and you're going to be facing down the field. You're going to miss that jam, and you're going to be automatically in a trail position. It's just physics, I guess we could call it, all right? So if you're going to align close enough to touch a guy, touch him immediately. The moment he moves, shoot those hands. This is not something that I teach because eventually down the road, you're going to have to change your technique because when you get to college, and if you're lucky enough to make it all the way to the pros, those guys are not going to allow you to align that close. They will slide back as far as humanly possible, as far as a ref will allow them, and you won't be able to touch them right away. Now you're going to have to totally change your technique. My advice to guys is, Back off to a yard and a half. Start there. Find your depth. Now the first move by that wide receiver isn't sending you into a panic. It doesn't put a guy too far away from you. If he jumps and gets vertical right now, um, you're going to panic. Your feet are going to get wide. You're going to probably throw the wrong hand, and you are will a lot of times miss the jam. So, Francis, this could be what is happening to you. And, of course, you're going to want to do everything to correct that. So a line started a yard and a half. Be patient. Develop a kick slide. If you're not familiar with what a kick slide is or you've heard of it but you don't know uh, much about it, again, got videos on it, a video on it on my YouTube channel. You can find it there. And it's definitely a big part of what I talk about in the All Eyes DB Camp members area where you can um, develop your kick slide. I've got a number of good drills in there that helps you develop a kick slide. Everyone, all corners that are playing press man need to develop a kick slide. You have to, you have to, you have to. That's a big part of your press man success. If you don't have a kick slide, you're just going to be a guy that opens the gate all the time. You're going to give receivers too much room to work their routes the way that it's drawn up in their playbook, and you're just going to have a problem. It's not your, your key to long-term success is not opening the gate, so you're going to need to learn a kick slide. So you find your depth. Again, start at a yard and a half. Use your kick slide to widen a guy. When you're off at a yard and a half, you don't have to panic off his first move. You don't get shook by that first move. You can move with in a smooth manner, slide, get yourself in front of him, and now you're going to find yourself getting your hands on that guy more. You're going to get more solid jams. Um, and you won't miss as often because you're not panicking and just throwing a hand um, and and missing. The, the only analogy I could give you is when you align too close, it's like having the pitcher walk down off the mound, halfway down, and throw the ball into the catcher's mitt. You won't have enough time to react, see if that's a strike, and swing and strike the ball. That's essentially what you're doing. What you want is that pitcher all the way on the mound, where are you supposed to be 90 feet away and you in the batter's box and you have at least some time to react to the pitch to determine whether it's a curveball or a fastball, whether it's in the strike zone or not in the strike zone and whether or not you want to swing at it. Same thing happening at the line of scrimmage. Is this guy coming right at me where I could jam him? Is he trying to go left or right that I need to slide and put my hands on him? You need time to be able to determine that and move and then get your jam. Um, on that wide receiver. So those are the two major things that I would attack. And um, that is, it, you get those two things right, you're going to start getting your hands on wide receivers, right? You definitely are going to, I'm not saying you're going to get a jam every time. If you're going up against really super highly skilled, experienced wide receivers, yeah, it's a task. It's, it's like trying to get a hit off of a really good pitcher. Sometimes you'll hit them, sometimes you won't. 
Now, if there's a really bad pitcher in there and he just doesn't have anything and he's throwing the ball over the plate, you're going to get more hits. So against inexperienced wide receivers who aren't as savvy, you'll get more jams. Against a better wide receiver, you will get less jams, but you will get jams. And as it sounds like, Francis, you're you you know you're probably missing uh, more than 80% of the time. If you go through these two things that I talked about with you, fixing your eyes, making sure they're on the hips, and then also sliding back a little bit, you're going to find yourself having a lot more success getting your jams and um, and then feeling good about your press man reps. And if your team is going to be running a bunch of press man, it is in your best interest to um, fix these things because it's a major part of what you guys do. And if that is what you guys are doing, you're just going to have to get good at it. And of course, this is going to require some little extra time from you. So either you get out early before practice or you stay late after practice and um, you work these things. I've got a great three release drill that you can find once again in the all ISTB camp members area. And I would advise all of you, I've referenced it several times for you to join that. There's just so much information in there um, that you can take advantage of. So, you know, between 101 DB tips and an all eyes DB camp membership, um, you guys are just going to become really, really uh, good at playing defensive back, whether it's corner, safety, nickel, whatever the case may be. But all right, Francis from Philadelphia, try those two things, and I would love to hear back from you how things are going. If you have a defensive back question, anything of coverage, uh, technique, playing in the secondary, even if you're a linebacker and you got to find yourself in coverage, I get a lot of questions from those guys. Feel free to reach out to me. Send your question to cwilson at alliesdbcamp.com. For my YouTube audience, go ahead and hit that question down in the comment section. There are no silly questions. There are no dumb questions. Everyone starts playing this game at different times. Early on, you'll have questions that are more basic. Later on in the game, you have more complicated questions. Hit them all down there in the comment section. Would love to hear from you. Hey everyone, are you tired of the hassle of finding last-minute tickets to your favorite events? Look no further than Game Time. The Game Time ticketing app is your go-to source for scoring amazing deals on last-minute tickets to sports, games, concerts, theater shows, and more. And with my exclusive discount code, TRUEFAN, you can get a discount on your first purchase. With Game Time's new Game Time Picks feature, you don't have to sort through thousands of tickets. You get only the best deals, and that's right up until the last minute. Their easy-to-use app shows a detailed view from the seat before you buy so you know exactly what you're getting. No more having your view blocked. You don't want to sit in the sun. You get to see all of that before you make your purchase. And the best part, their all-in pricing shows you exactly what you're going to pay before you get out your credit card. There's no more waiting for that other shoe to drop at checkout. So whether you're a diehard sports fan, a music lover, or you're just looking for a fun night out with your girl, Game Time has you covered. Download the Game Time app today and don't forget to use the promo code TRUEFAN for an exclusive discount on your first purchase. Don't miss out on the action. Get your tickets now with Game Time. And finally on the show, I wanted to talk a little bit about, well, not a little bit. We're going to talk about um, an undertrained skill that defensive backs, you know, I know what you guys do. You go out, you get really caught up in your footwork, which you should. It's really a big part of, you know, your success as a defensive back. You got to have footwork. You probably had a DB coach at some point in your life say slow feet, uh, don't eat, or something close to that. And that is true. If you've got slow feet, you're not going to play defensive back. So I know guys will focus on that. Uh, you'll focus on your speed. You'll, you know, work a lot on your press man coverage. And, you know, those things should be worked on. But one thing I see guys falling off on, um, is their hands, all right? And you know the old joke about, you know, DBs were just wide receivers who couldn't catch. All right, uh, funny. You, you hear people on offense saying that kind of stuff. But the truth of the matter is, is that we on this side of the ball, defensive backs, don't have as much time to catch the ball in practice as wide receivers do. That's a big part of what they do. They spend a lot of time in practice doing that. Do we catch the ball in practice? Sure, but not nearly as much as wide receivers. Oh, and by the way, when the ball is thrown, that's who we're fighting for the ball, a guy who catches the ball a lot more in practice than we do. So if you just sit here and think about it, a ball is coming in your direction. There is a guy next to you who is more trained 
to catch that ball than you are. Just think about that for a moment. Are you going to be able to catch as many balls in practice as a wide receiver? Typically, no. If you're a, an obsessed kind of guy, you can catch a ton of footballs off to the side when you're not in, just something you can do instead of sitting around. But by and large, you're just not going to catch as many footballs as a wide receiver. You are going to have to spend some time with that. Um, you know, as I said, there's a lot of parts to playing this position. Uh, foot placement, you know, getting out of your brakes, changing directions, backpedaling. There's, you know, so many parts to this game. And sometimes it feels overwhelming, all the stuff that you've got to train. But turnovers are a big part of this game now, all right? Um, I'm not saying they weren't ever, but now more than ever, considering all of the rules now that work against you as a defensive back, there's less contact, things of that nature. There's more of a premium now on getting the football, stealing pos uh, possessions from the other team. The better you, the more, the better and more you do that, the better chance you have of winning the football game. It's just simple, guys. Um, for us to do that consistently, we're just going to have to get better at, we're going to have to have a net for getting interceptions. Big part of that is catching the football, taking advantage of the opportunities when they come our way. The best guys out there at this are the ones who maximize those opportunities. Let's, how many guys have been in a game and you really only had one opportunity at an interception or two opportunities at an interception? When they come, you have to be able to take advantage of them. I always point out a guy like Xavier and Howard, a guy that I've trained since he's come into the league. He has, throughout his career, been very, very good at maximizing the interception opportunities that come his way because he's really good at catching the football, all right? So um, we've got to execute when the ball arrives against the guy who's um, training daily to handle that situation. So I feel like there are four elements to having the ball skills that you need as a defensive back to make things happen the way they need to happen out on the field. Number one is learning how to catch with your eyes. A lot of guys will say, oh, I've got bad hands, or you know, something's wrong with my hands. When a guy's having a hard time catching a football, people will say that, you know, it's, you got bad hands. The truth of the matter is that you catch the ball with your eyes. There are very few instances in my training where I see guys with a hands problem. Um, you know, you don't have a broken finger, you know, maybe a guy has smaller hands, nothing you could do about that. Maybe a guy has a weak grip. There's something you could do about that. We'll talk about that. Or you might have poor positioning of the hands when the ball arrives, but far more often the problem are the eyes. Many defensive backs take the catch for granted. This means that as the ball is just arriving and it's about to hit their hands, their eyes go elsewhere. I don't, you know, they're thinking about running off with it, or they just look away because that's the habit. Um, they'll look beyond the the ball down the field, whatever the case may be. You can't do that. If you do not track the ball into your hands, there's a good chance it will hit the wrong part of your hands, or it won't even hit your hands at all. How many times has the point of the ball hit your, hit the palm of your hand? That's 100% happened to you because you took your eyes off the ball. If you tracked it all the way in, the, the point of that ball won't hit the palm of your hands. You got to make it your aim to train your hands to track the ball into the web of your hands. I often tell my guys to freeze their eyes on the football when it hits their hands for two seconds. This forces you to track it. Try it the next time you've, you're having a problem catching in practice or in a training session. You drop two balls, get yourself back to say to yourself, freeze your eyes on the ball. That means ball hits your hands and you freeze your eyes on it for two seconds. That retrains your eyes. The next now is training your grip. As I said previously, sometimes the problem is your hands. It's rarer than the eyes problem, but nevertheless, let's make sure that's not the problem. The truth is sometimes the ball is traveling at a high rate of speed and even your eyes on it can't stop it from splitting your hands open. If you don't have naturally, if you don't naturally have a strong grip, Get a tennis ball or a racquetball and start squeezing. Carry it around with you all day and train your grip. You'll be amazed how fast you can improve your grip strength by doing this. Also, Amazon sells grip strength devices at a very low price. I might link to one here um, in the comment section or actually in the description. Um, get yourself one of those. You can go on Amazon and, sh and search grip strength. You'll find that there. Make the purchase. Add that to your daily routine. 
Finally, a few exercises at the end of your upper body workout to improve your forearm strength, like wrist curls, uh, reverse wrist curls like this with the barbell in your hand will definitely improve your grip. The next one is obvious, but not so obvious. A lot of guys struggle with this. Look for the ball. It's as simple as that. Think about how many times guys don't look for the ball as a defensive back. Perhaps you're one of those guys. If you aren't a guy that naturally looks for the ball, then you're going to have to train it. I'm here to tell you that if you don't look for it, you won't catch it. Too many defensive backs won't look for the ball out of fear that they will either misjudge it or when they look, the ball will be right there and pass them into the receiver's hands. Get over that fear right now. When you put yourself into really good position against the wide receiver, look for the football. If it's not there, you can always get your eyes back to the wide receiver and continue to track his hip. Close out the space between you and the wide receiver. Get your head around and prepare to make a big play. Practice this after practice, practice it during practice. You really have got to get this simple thing down. Simply go through your press steps, run through a couple of routes, and look for the ball as someone throws it to you. You don't even need a receiver there with you to do this particular, um, to do this in practice. If you have a receiver to run down there with you, great. If you don't have one, you could simply do that. Go through your press steps, run through a couple of routes, and then look for the ball as someone throws it to you. It will get you in receiver mode so that you're able to be more comfortable when the ball is coming. The next thing is tracking the football. This is specifically for the deep ball. So the corner routes, the post routes, the go routes, some guys simply struggle in that area. You'll do everything right, turn your head around, and misjudge the football. This is a function of inexperience. Outfielders in baseball have to shag fly balls constantly so they get used to judging the flight of the ball off the bat and get up under it. Guess what you're going to have to do? If you struggle in this area, then spend some time lining up in press, against ear, running go routes, post routes, and corner routes with someone throwing the ball to you. Learn how to judge the ball, smoothly get in position. As a rule, the higher the ball is, the more you need to run and the deeper you need to get. The ball will take time to come down and most likely travel a further distance. Use that time to get deeper down the field. A ball on a rise requires you to run. A ball on its way down means you can slow down unless it's right above your head, in which case you're in trouble and you better keep running. A low ball, i.e. a line drive throw, which it will typically cover less ground unless it's thrown by Josh Allen or Patrick Mahomes. A low ball means you can throttle down some. You can typically jump and stretch out your hands on a line drive if you've not reached that spot yet. Height of the ball matters, so you guys want to keep that in mind as you're tracking the football. The final thing, man, is just attacking the football. One of the biggest things I notice with many young DBs when I begin training them is a desire to want to get the ball into their body when they're doing ball drills. They want to they want to trap the ball against their body. They want to catch it in their stomach. If that's you, you need to end that right now. Nine, out, nine and a half times out of ten when you're trying to catch the ball in a game or in practice, a receiver is right there next to you doing the same thing. Guess what? Guess who gets the ball? The guy with his hands extended the furthest away from his body. Guess who practices catching all day? As I said, the receivers do. Guess who's going to extend their hands to catch that ball? The receiver. Guess who also needs to extend their hands if they want the ball? I think you got it. It's you. Make it a habit to try and catch the ball with your hands fully extended every time it's thrown. You want to get into that practice. Get comfortable doing that. Failing to do that is like going to war for the Army and not knowing how to shoot. You're going to lose those battles with that receiver almost every time. I would much rather you drop footballs in the beginning trying to extend your arms to catch them instead of setting up this false sense of security by body catching a ball and saying, oh, well, I caught it. Well, you caught it against your body. In the game, when a receiver's next to you and he extends his arms, you're not going to be, that ball is never going to get to your body. So all those body catches in practice are meaningless because that's not what's going to happen in the game. So finally, in conclusion here, you can improve your ability to catch the football and force more turnovers by focusing on the things that I talked about here, which is A, using your eyes to catch the ball. You've got to train your grip. Make sure your hands, uh, the strength of your hands is not a problem. Turning your head around, you can't catch what you can't see. 
and improving your tracking so that you don't misjudge those deep balls. Some of you guys have a problem with that. And then finally, you just got to attack that ball when it's there. Don't let things enter into your mind. Don't start thinking about the wide receiver or a whole bunch of other things. See the ball, attack the ball. And I always use baseball analogies because believe it or not, these things are close together. That ball is coming into the strike zone. You've got to attack the ball with your bat. You can't stand here and you know, kind of softly throw your bat at it. You've got to try and strike that ball. So when that football is coming in, I'm not asking you to bat it away, but you've got to aggressively attack with your hands to go get that football. So the final piece to this is after you've done everything else right and that ball's coming in, attack the football with your hands. Put those things together. Watch how you up your interception total. Watch how things start coming together for you as a playmaker. This Doing these things could take you from two interceptions to five interceptions, from four interceptions to eight to a double-digit guy. The guys that get those double-digit interceptions, believe you me, they have very good ball skills, so you might as well start working on them if you want to be a guy with a high interception total. All right, that's going to do it for me on this edition of the Indie Drills Podcast. I want to thank you guys for listening and watching. If you happen to be doing that on YouTube, wherever you are taking this in, Please go ahead and subscribe to the channel right now or subscribe on the uh, whatever you're using to stream this on the podcast. Got great shows like this coming out each and every week. So don't miss out on any of them. If you're on YouTube, hit the bell so you're notified the next time I put out a great video like this one. Also on your way out, man, check it out in the description. 101 DB Tips. This is a book. If you are a DB coach, you are DB, you're a trainer of DBs, you need this in your library. You got to stick that one in there. Also, consider joining the All ISDB Camp members area. Over 200 videos on there with all types of stuff. Coverage analysis, techniques, drills, workouts, um, ex coverages explained. A combination of the book and the members area will definitely get you to where you want to be and need to be as a defensive back. All right, that's it for me. I'm heading out. And until next time, All ISDB Camp. Consistency breeds results.